Talks with Jacobs here on Talk Sport. If you just joined us, you may not know that the Merseyside Derby has been cleared uh, to be held at Goodison Park. Um, so it's rather timely that uh, we should chat to Evertonian, friend of the show, but we've been keeping an eye on him in lockdown, Mr. Mike Parry. Good afternoon, Mike. Good afternoon, guys. Thanks very much indeed. And you're absolutely right. This is a very, very timely conversation we're going to have because I've had it in my head now, the plan that I've got for the fans to be able to get involved in the uh, Merseyside derby. It could lead to uh, Liverpool winning their first um, Premiership title in 30 years. I have no angst about that whatsoever. I have no angst about them doing that at Goodison Park. But to get the fans involved, I've got this fantastic plan, guys, and it's called the Merseyside Spider, OK? Right, yeah. Yes. Now, the Merseyside Spider means this. If you look at Goodison Park, like a lot of um, football grounds built in that era, you know, 150 years ago and whatever, mm -hmm. there are lots of little terrace streets around the ground. Two and a half sides of Goodison is surrounded by right. these wonderful terrace streets, you know, with these beautiful terraced houses which two and three generations of families have lived in. If you let the fans walk around a six-mile route of terrace streets around Goodison Park, each two metres apart each carrying their club flag, each listening to the commentary on their phones in their ears because it's being broadcast on Talk Sport, you could involve thousands of fans on the day in the participation of the game without any risk to anybody and without bre uh, breaching any, you know, social distancing rules. There's literally dozens and dozens of terrace streets around Goodison, and you could have the Merseyside snake or the Merseyside spider going on for six or seven miles throughout the 90 minutes of the game. Right. OK, well, it's a thing. I'm not sure the police would think, because there could be a, a bit of a tendency to, in the big moment, whether Everton win and stop Liverpool yeah, doing it, Liverpool or something do it, like that. No, it's not yeah. all no. suddenly congregate on the ground no you would but you you would you would trust in the sense and the yeah. common sense and the good heartedness of merseyside people because that's what they're like okay and i'm telling you it's a plan that when i make it public it will be picked up by the fans and there will be an enormous flow of support for this and i'm going to contact everton football club and tell them about this i'm going to contact the merseyside police to tell them i've solved their problem can you not see it can you not see a march of people two or three miles long you, and it would all be one way you go up one street turn left at the top down the next street turn right up the next you see what i mean yeah, all the, exhausting all the, you, wouldn't you, it for 90 you stay minute and watch walk? it on the telly no. i mean you'd be no. looking no. through no. people's windows on these terrace no, no. houses watching the game no, no. Wouldn't you? Uh, yeah yeah but people can watch football on the telly all the time but our grounds are always still full because people prefer to be there they prefer to be where the action is and they yeah. can get as close to the action by walking those terrace streets right in the district of Walton, in Liverpool, whilst football history is being made on the other side of those walls to Goodison Park. I personally think it's a brilliant idea. OK, Mike, well, we'll see what sort right, of feedback yeah, well, you get we'll from see. the club. Yeah, um, yeah. Now, you know, I thought you'd like this story. This is a fairly recent story. University yes. researchers, it's a joint study from uh, Reading University um, yes. and Ohio State. Uh, they yeah. have looked at basically in, into the fact that goals in football, they feel, are possibly yeah. too small for the size of the exactly. players. Does that exactly. sound familiar? Of course. My, well, they it say sounds my, absolutely familiar. Yeah, it's what I, you I, said, I, wasn't I, it? Your theory. Yeah, my Raise the Bar campaign now has been going on for two or three years. I've had mm. acknowledgement from Gordon Taylor at the Football Association. I've had acknowledgement from um, that great uh, bright referee, the guy who used to be a housemaster at Harrow, you know, David Ellery. David Ellery, yes, uh, yeah. He, he, he's acknowledged it. Um, I'm rather disappointed with Henry Winter, who is a, a very long-lasting pal and a regular uh, correspondent on your show, because I sent Henry all the plans for this. I sent him the diagrams. I sent him the, you know, the technical measurements of how big the goal would be later. And for some unknown reason, Henry hasn't written, you know, voluminously about it in the Times, <laughs> which I find, you know, I find very odd. I think Henry might have missed the trick there, because mm. if somebody else, some other university is now getting onto it, it doesn't blame me. Wasn't it just a few weeks ago, fellas, that some European goalkeeper, some goalkeeper on the continent, actually commented about the fact that the goals are too small, necking my idea? 
Yeah, quite possibly. It is, yeah, it, it's true, though. I mean, if your your original logic was yeah. right, if you look at goalkeepers yeah. in the in the late fifties, people like Eddie Hopkinson and even Ron right. Spring, people like, they weren't big. These keepers, no. they they're not like no. Peter Czech or, or Courtois. Or, you know, well, six Gordon, foot Gordon seven. Banks was like, was he? Gordon no. Banks was just about six foot. You know, Ron Spring, as you quite yeah. rightly say, a great legendary Everton goalkeeper. Gordon West wasn't even uh, six feet tall. And what's happened is because of nutrition and because of the fact that we all live better over the last 20 or 30 years, goalkeepers now are average height of about six foot four. Some of them, as we know, are six foot six or six foot seven. It's ludicrous that a goalkeeper can stand on his tiptoes these days and with a little hop, he can nut the crossbar. That's not what the crossbar was made for. The crossbar was made to finally cut off the space of, 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 of air above the, the goalkeeper where the ball could go in. So, I mean, it used to be the goal, the goal post, no, the goal, the, the crossbar used to be made of string. It wasn't yeah. there as a finite sort of position, you know, it was there to indicate that that's a goal and that's not a goal and it needs to be raised by at least six inches and I'll go blue in the face talking about it until it's done. Would you like to go back to the days of the string crossbar, Mike? I, think that would I work? would. Yeah, it'd be fun, wouldn't it? It'd have been a devil in 1966, though, wouldn't it, really? Yeah, well, it certainly would have been. It'd be a bit like playing football on the beach, really, wouldn't it? You know, there's yeah. no boundaries until it hits the water, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so that'd be a bit difficult. Now, fellas, I suppose you'd like to tell me, uh, you'd like me to tell you about my uh, campaign to get zoos permanently closed down, would you? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, if, yes. I, if, I, yeah. if I was in the zoo yeah. business, I wouldn't be massively yeah. pleased about this. Yeah. But, uh, well, yeah. well, yeah, well, as you know, fellas, I come from Chester, right? And yeah. Chester has got one of the biggest zoos in this country. And I, yeah. I think it's something like the second or third most popular tourist attraction in this country. And mm. I went to Chester Zoo, which is in a district of Chester called Upton, when I was a kid. And, you know, it was great looking at all the baboons and, you know, the elephants and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But then as I've grown up and I've realised that actually zoos are animal prisons... I've turned against them massively, and I think they should all be closed down. Because it's hideous in this day and age to think that we can take animals and incarcerate them in tiny little compounds and think that they won't suffer huge mental damage. And I'm quite serious about this, fellas. I think zoos are an absolute atrocity. And people say, oh, they do lots mm. of work, you know, for conservation. Well, you don't need to conserve animals to keep them in prison. I mean, for instance, do you guys wake up every day and say, my God, I don't know if miss the dodo, because the dodo is an Australian <laughs> bird. Funny enough, I do. Okay? <laughs> 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 yeah. I like I went I went to a zoo in Buenos Aires once and uh, right. they had it was boiling hot day and they had yeah. a polar bear and I was struck with the same thing oh, no. this is disgusting you can't give up and then eventually they they closed the city council closed the zoo down I think primarily because of this polar bear which you could right. possibly keep in sort of 90 degree heat I'm playing devil's advocate here zoos would argue yeah. that they do lots of good work around uh, conservation and education we don't and, want to uh, conserve animals that can't survive in the wild you know Darwin was right it's survival of the fittest and, and that's the way the world was made that if you can't survive in your natural environment you don't survive but they don't lock them up in prisons for the rest of their life now i saw a correspondent on tv that's mm. another medium not as good as radio of course fellas but you know we watch it occasionally and um and, and and this lady was standing in a viewing platform overlooking the giraffe enclosure at chester zoo okay and I thought the size of a giraffe and the size of the enclosure over which she was standing was nothing more than hideous cruelty. And the one, th the one problem we've got is if we do close all the zoos down, we could return a lot of the animals to the wild. We could actually take the animals to much better sort of areas to live in, like the Kruger National Park in South Africa. But I'm afraid we'd have to kill all the giraffes because you can't transport a giraffe because of its size. You right. simply can't in this country. Because we have bridges over roads and railways, you can't transport a giraffe. A giraffe can't lie down and it can't um, stand up straight uh, and bow its neck to get under bridges. I mean, it could. How could they get it in the right. first place? That's why, <laughs> guess why <laughs> giraffes don't have Uber <laughs> accounts. Yeah, yeah, well, How do they the, get... Uh, <laughs> Well, they must be able to be best. transported. No, who, no. who wants to transport? I mean, it's, yeah. No, it's all giraffes. It's, an in, it's, it's, yeah, it's an interesting theory. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, all giraffes are yeah. second or third generation in zoos in this country. Yeah. So, actually, what they did is they got a few baby giraffes like 50, hmm. 60 years ago, right? And then they brought them here and, and, and they've been breeding. But you can't transport a giraffe. How would you get a giraffe, um, for instance, 
around the M25, eh? Oh, it, it'd lose its head. That's a good question. Look, Mike, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's never been asked just, before just, on talk. Just uh, very, very quickly. We've only got yeah. a few seconds left, but it's the anniversary yeah. of the first ever Oxford Cambridge boat race, yes. isn't it, Mike? That's is right. It, yeah, are, the, are you a fan Cambridge of are you, are you a fan of 1829. That sport, well, well, listen, I'm not against it. I'm not against the elitism of Oxford and Cambridge. I think they're fine institutions. But what I would say is this: it's been going on for so long. Whichever boat is in the lead after the first six strokes <laughs> always wins. You've never seen uh, one of the boats overtake the other in the boat race. So what I'm saying is, let's include 16 of the top universities, rowing universities in this country, and let's have a, a group of 16, a draw, eight ties, four ties, two ties, and then the final on the River Thames, on boat race day, but it shouldn't always be Oxford and Cambridge. It should be the best rowing crew. Fantastic, Mike. If we covered some ground there, we'll catch up with you soon. All the best, thanks for joining us. Okay, guys. That's there we are, Mike Parry. Everybody, if, if uh, Mum goes to the zoo have next Monday, team. <laughs> have a great time. Um, Charlie the cabbie said he picked up a, he picked up a giraffe three o'clock in the morning. I wouldn't go south of the river at that time of night, of course. And um, the